I might get some of these names wrong, so I'm very sorry if I do. All right. Um, Today I am reading from Acts um, 2, verses 1 to 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to the rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying, now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Phrygia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Amy. So Julianne comes to us from the beautifully sunny city of Melbourne, and uh, we're, not that we're bragging or anything, and, um, and uh, works for City to City Australia, has previously done a lot of work with uh, AFES, yeah. AFES, whatever, uh, uh, AFES, student, uni students, student and um, which many of you have um, had, had a connection with, and uh, we're just grateful that you're here, Julianne. So, Thanks, yeah. Uh, let me pray for you as sure. you bring the word. Father, we thank you uh, for uh, this season that we've had and the blessing that it's been to us um, as members of the Billabong in learning how to share our faith and, and, and growing confidence um, mm. in bringing the good news of Jesus to others. We, we thank you for Julianne's part in that mm. and our, our ch- the chance we've had to partner with her. We pray that you would bless her and speak through her this morning mm. as she delivers uh, a word from um, from the scriptures this morning, from this passage we've just read. Mm. We ask that your Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit that was poured out on all flesh, would empower her and speak through her this morning and open our hearts to hear what you would have to say mm. in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Amen. Oh, really great to be here. I grew up in the Uniting Church, so it sort of feels like I've come home a bit. I married an Anglican, it's just like, oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, well done for sort of getting through the Ripple Effect uh, Module 1. Uh, I'm in the midst of, uh, we've produced uh, the third module, which is about how do you read the Bible with someone, and we're about to put the fourth module together, which is about uh, uh, answering the things you're most scared to get asked. So you can probably imagine where we're going with that. And I, we sort of had to work out, it's sort of our fourth module and we've had to put it on pause a little bit because of the laws in Victoria that we just were a bit unsure about what we could say and not say at this point in time. Although I have, I sort of put it together, but then a friend of mine's been doing the writing and she wants to stay anonymous and partly it's because I say, well, if, you know, we do end up in prison over this course, I'm okay to go to prison because look, everyone's locked in, they can't get away from me, I'm going to be telling them about Jesus. <laughs> and my other friends go, just keep me out of this. <laughs> anyway, so I hope it's been good because just really just getting back to basics in some ways and yeah, working out what the gospel is, how can we actually really talk about this? So I thought I'd better start off by talking about um, a story that's happened for me first up. And uh, so a friend of mine, so I'm sort of at the older phase, I have um, young adult, well actually 27, do you call that a young adult anymore? Anyway, my oldest child's 27, we have four kids and I had them in five and a half years, so I'm one of those crazy people who just didn't get much sleep for quite a long time. <laughs> and uh, we ran playgroups at our church and a uh, uh, 
a woman came along with three boys. Uh, her name was Anne Marie. She, um, over time, actually became a Christian. She, um, her husband had left her for somebody else, and she was, yeah, she wasn't um, financially struggling, but actually, yeah, it was just tough with three boys, little boys. Anyway, she ended up becoming a Christian over time, and then when the boys were in high school, she started saying, oh, I'm not sure if I really agree with the church's stance on things. I don't think I'm a Christian anymore. And it was sort of, you know, those discouraging sort of conversations that you have and you just go, God, what are you doing in this? And the boys were totally um, not at all interested. Anyway, she ended up meeting this, it was a great non-Christian guy. He's a truck driver at Audi. He, um, yeah, just one of those loves footy, ocker sort of guys. And they ended up getting married. We went to their wedding. You know, we had them over for barbecues and stuff like that. And then um, we in Melbourne, I don't know if you guys know about this, but we're in lockdown for about two years. <laughs> I, did you do any lockdown at all in Perth? One week. <laughs> I know. I'm seriously, as I've, because it's my first time in Perth, and as I've driven around, I just go, I can't believe you got to be in this space for that whole time when we were stuck in our house <laughs> for like two years. Anyway, so we were allowed to go for a walk for one hour uh, within the 5K range, and Anne Marie was in my 5K range. So her and I uh, went for a walk, and when we caught up, she basically said straight away, look, um, so her husband that she did marry had three boys as well, so there were six boys in the house. Anyway, they're all sort of young adults now, and, but Andrew's youngest son was 17 in year 12, and her, his girlfriend's father had given him a Bible, and he was reading it, and he was asking my friend Anne-Marie, yeah, what do you make of this? And she's going... I don't know, like she was just sort of frozen. I don't know what I think about this anymore. And so we caught up for a walk and she said, Joanne, could you meet with Andrew's younger son and help him work out what the Bible says? And I'm going, oh, I sort of can't because he's 17. You can't do that one-on-one -on -one sort of thing with, in terms of safe ministries. And so I just went, oh, could you ask if his girlfriend will do it as well? Maybe we'll do something, rather than just going straight into the Bible, I wanted to give him a big picture about Jesus, so we might do Alpha together. And we can do it online then. Anyway, so I went, okay. And then she went and asked her um, husband's son and girlfriend, do they want to do Alpha with Julianne online? And they messaged back straight away and said, yeah. Like, we'd love to do that. We've got all these questions and really keen to chat with someone about it. So I went, okay, this is awesome. All right, so then I went, why don't I ask Andrew and Anne-Marie as well? Like, this would be amazing. Like, it would be help them sort things out. Anyway, I didn't hear the next day. Like, I asked, I texted, didn't hear anything back. Uh, then the next day, I didn't hear anything back. You know that sinking feeling where you just go, we're now not friends anymore. This is horrible. Like, why aren't they replying? Have I overstepped the mark? Anyway, then the third day came around, still nothing. And like, you just really have this sinking feeling about how this could go. Anyway, the third night, got a text and Anne-Marie goes, yep. Andrew and I are going to do it with you. And I'm going, why was I so dramatic? Like, basically, they just had to have time to have that conversation. <laughs> anyway, so then I went, oh, gosh, I'm on a roll. Four of them. I'm going to ask all the six boys and all their girlfriends to come to Alpha. Anyway, none of them wanted to, but <laughs> it would have been a great story. <laughs> anyway, so then um, we did Alpha, the four of us. They sat on a couch together. I just zoomed in, and uh, each week I would say, yeah, what do you think a response should be about Jesus? I wasn't a direct answer. I was just sort of saying, you're reading about Jesus, and you're hearing about him. What should a response be? And... Andrew kept on saying, well, you should take him seriously. And I'm just going, he has not had one single background about Jesus. This is the first time he's ever heard of him. Anyway, so then each week kept asking these questions. And on the sixth week, I really go in. Like I go, right, 
This is about you and Jesus. What are you going to do now? So I'm asking them really directly, what should your response be? Anyway, Anne-Marie straight away goes, I don't know what I've been doing for the last 10 years. I need to get back on track with Jesus. I am in. I'm recommitting. Anyway, so then I said, Andrew, Andrew, what's your response to Jesus? And he goes, I want to become a Christian. <laughs> and I went, are you sure? <laughs> like, I just went, You're only six weeks in. You don't know much. And he goes, yeah, I'm in. Anyway, I'm going, hmm, okay. And then the, yeah, the son goes, oh, I want to make a small step. I'm not really 100% in yet, but I want to find out more. And his girlfriend said, I want to recommit. So how, praise God for that, right? So that was one joyful thing that happened in lockdown. So <laughs> it wasn't much else. Uh, <laughs> and so basically, um, they've been in our life group now for two years, and there's been a transformation in them both. So it's been absolutely wonderful to see God's spirit at work, and actually they've changed to just be more like Jesus. This is an Oki, Aussie sort of truck driver, actually just gentle and beautiful about Jesus. How awesome is that? <laughs> well, this passage is really about a tr- how do we really get transformed? And it's really, we're learning about the Holy Spirit. But I want to give you a bit of history, though, because actually it's quite significant what's gone on in terms of how it connects back into the Old Testament. So I don't know if you know this, but you know when Passover happened just before Jesus died? That was when, you know, the Passover in Israel, like in Egypt, and the firstborn were killed, and then God's firstborn was killed the next day, uh, Jesus. But then they used to have this festival called the Festival of Weeks, 50 days after Passover. And actually, that's why all these people from all the different countries were there. They were coming to celebrate Festival of Weeks. And I don't, does anyone know what the Festival of Weeks is about? So they, no? Huh? Okay, so it's basically what they come and do is they celebrate when God came down, you know, on uh, Mount Sinai. Oh gosh, I'm going to get all my details wrong. <laughs> And he came down by fire and thunder and lightning, and he basically brought the law, okay? And so um, the law was the way that they could relate together. And they basically come, and as uh, in their festival, they bring the first fruits. So they'd lost their firstborns, and now here they're coming in terms of bringing their first fruits. So it's sort of a significant time. They're coming to sort of celebrate that God came down and, yeah, he came in quite a sort of powerful way. And here we get the, yeah, the Holy Spirit coming in a similar sort of fashion. The other interesting thing in this passage is, you know, with the Tower of Babel, they all learnt, they basically all ended up getting different languages, so they couldn't work together to be able to build the Tower of Babel. This is the opposite. So they all actually get... The, a different language, they, get it, they understand it in their own language so they can go out and tell people about Jesus. How just so significant in terms of this particular moment, 50 days after Jesus died. So I guess the question always comes to me when I read this passage is, well, how does transformation happen? Like this is the spirit. Do I have the spirit? Like have I really seen that much transformation happened in my life. In fact, I think I'm going downhill. Is that how you feel? (laughs) I feel like I'm getting worse (laughs) as I get older. I don't know. No one's relating to me. (laughs) Is it just me? (laughs) So I guess, um, and in fact, we, um, I don't know, I probably shouldn't say this, but anyway, we had this really great guy living with us, and he kept on saying to me, Julianne, like you're like so almost perfect. And I'm going, I'm not. The older I get, the more I realize just every single sin in my life. Like you actually become more and more aware of what God, God is doing. So anyway, that's, that was how <laughs> I explained it. But the thing is, in the Old Testament, the Spirit hovered. Do you remember how it talks about that? It hovers over the earth and it sort of, it sort of comes into a person at, at different points 
But actually, as we find in this passage is the spirit indwells. It's quite a different sort of thing. It actually doesn't hover anymore. It just indwells into each of us. And this is what we see with the disciples, is that they actually are massively transformed, right? So they were like cowering in their room. They just weren't at all sure what to do or say. But actually, they were transformed by the Spirit. But I just want to give you some background in terms of what is the Spirit and what does the Spirit do? So the Spirit convicts us. The first one is he convicts us of our sins. So if you feel any guilt or shame at any point, that's a good thing. Because actually, that's the Spirit of God in you saying, hey, we're not fine with this. We're not fine with how this is going. So praise God if you feel guilt or shame. That's the spirit who's convicting you of your sin. All right, the second thing that the spirit does is he points us to Jesus. So the fact that you understand what Jesus has done for you and you are really amazed by Jesus' death on the cross and know that it's for you, that's that's the spirit helping you understand Now, the reason I've actually seen this happen quite dramatically. So my brother, uh, when he left sort of high school, he went down the whole drinking, sort of sleeping around phase. And um, when we we all just, like, everyone in our family is like me. We're all just pretty committed about Jesus and we love him and we talk about him a lot. Anyway, my, we all, my sisters, I've got three, there's three of us, and we we're all talking to my brother. My mum was talking to my brother, trying to help him understand who Jesus was. It was just like he couldn't get it. Anyway, one night, my brother was paralytic drunk, and he, the police had pulled him over, and he just sort of said to God, if you are real... I'm for you because this is not really going well for me at this point. And um, my mum rang me and she goes, something's happened to your brother, Bruce. And she goes, this is something different about him. But he didn't say anything to mum. Anyway, he came and visited me and my husband. And as soon as he walked in the door, I just went, there's something different about you. You just could see it. And he went, yeah, I've become a Christian. And he goes, it's... and." The really great thing is when you have friends or family who become Christians, you get feedback on how you went. (laughs) And I said, Bruce, we spent so much time trying to help you understand who Jesus was. And he goes, I just couldn't get it. I just going, why are you so, like, you're so weirdly interested in a man 2,000 years, like who lived 2,000 years ago. It's like it doesn't make any sense. And he goes, I just could not get it. And it wasn't until he surrendered and actually the spirit was at work, he understood. Okay, so actually the fact, if you understand who Jesus is, that's because the spirit has been at work in you and you've understood who Jesus is. So, but that's sort of good with evangelism, right? Because it's not on us. This is actually the Spirit of God who works and helps people understand. We could say so much stuff about Jesus, but it's not until the Spirit works in someone until they get it and understand. All right, the third thing about the Spirit is that the Spirit fills our hearts he, saw, he basically restores and transforms us and allows us to be truly human. <laughs> sort of a weird way to say it, but basically, the, the, and the Spirit gives us the gifts, right? Do you know what the gifts are? The gifts are overwhelming love for others, out-of-the-world peace. So it is, the peace that we have is really out of this world. Um, Off-the-charts joy, like People who just, we can have joy in all situations. Incredible kindness, surprising generosity, patience and gentleness, self-control, goodness, and forever faithfulness. Now, basically, those things are given to us as a gift from the Spirit that actually we can have peace and joy. They are the things that actually shift us and change us. And... 
In fact, I don't know if you think about those, but if you think about well-being in our schools and places, how people talk about it, they're actually talking about often these things, aren't they? And so these are things we need to flourish as human beings. All right, and then the fifth one is, and the Holy Spirit is our comforter and healer. And he wants to restore you. So I, the image I like to have it is that we all have pretty well broken hearts at some point where we've been hurt or betrayed or just so broken. I don't know if you feel this in terms of how we come to God is we've been so hurt at times and we have a broken heart, but actually the Spirit repairs it. He repairs our broken heart and he wants to heal us. So that's the fifth thing. But the sixth thing is... Well, and although I want to go back to that, our comfort and healer, and I just go, I want the spirit for my friends, don't you? Most of my friends seriously are brokenhearted about so many things, and you want the spirit to be able to restore and heal them back to the flourishing human being they need to be. And then the sixth point is he emboldens us and gives us courage. And I sort of, uh, what, I, what I try and um, picture this as being is actually that it's not that we're massively transformed in us. God does work in us. But actually, we're more of Jesus. Actually, that's how we're transformed. We're more about who Jesus is, and we're more about the Spirit. Does that make sense? So actually, he may do his thing, but it's like the more that he's in, the less of us there is. And I think that's what happens in terms of they're emboldened and given courage to speak. So when I think about this, though, I feel pretty weak as an evangelist. <laughs> I know I'm meant to be helping you all with this, but even with my friend, you know, Anne-Marie, I just like for the whole three days was a bit depressed about going, oh, man, we're now not friends anymore. She's not even replying to my text. And I'm going, that's so pathetic <laughs> and weak. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, that's not a courageous person. But actually, it was, it was the spirit that did his thing. I didn't really do a thing with Andrew becoming a Christian, although I did find out his brother had become a Christian 10 years and had prayed, his brother had prayed for him every day. Okay, so can you see how the strength is actually that's the spirit at work. And he, like I just did what I needed to do in terms of running something to help them in terms of working out their faith. But I don't even know, I could have run anything. I could have just been reading the Bible. I think Andrew would have just become a Christian. I didn't, because my first reaction was, what, are you sure? Like this doesn't make any sense that you know enough about this to commit to him. So he does. He commits, he basically emboldens us and gives us courage. I probably would say, what I would say in terms of evangelism is, he gives me wisdom to know when to say things and when to not, and he helps me discern. And, and I'm, like sometimes I say stuff and I go, where did that come from? Like I don't even know that made sense for that person and I hadn't really thought about it much, but actually that was the spirit at work, giving me the words and helping me uh, with that. Well, and it's also like the courage of going, okay, I might invite them all. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, that, that's actually the spirit at work helping me to have courage. The problem is, I think, when you look at this passage where the disciples were so filled with the spirit that they just went out and ended up speaking in another language, we look at that and we just, well, oh, that's not us, is it? We're not like that. So what are, does that mean we're weak as Christians? Does that mean we're not good at evangelism? And I think, yeah, over my years, so I worked as an evangelist for 20 years, and I would say that's the biggest thing in terms of doing evangelism is how up and down it is. You feel so weak as an evangelist. Like, I don't know, there's so many things that are coming up. Our society's changed so quickly at this point in time. Like, how do you even answer some of the questions or the ideologies that are coming around at this point? Like, there's something weak in us, right, to even know what to say. How do we respond to this? 
And I think that's okay, right? That's What that means is the weaker we are, the more powerful God is. And that was the thing leading up to this story. The disciples look so weak and pathetic. They hid themselves in the room. Do you know what I mean? So actually this is good because this is the spirit who's going to do what he's going to do. He wants to use us. He uses the weak vessel. He uses us. But actually it's on the spirit to do what he wants to do. So um, I wonder if out of this doing the ripple effect course, you felt you're able, more able to do evangelism. But if not, it's actually okay. It's actually God who will prepare the way. And part of the thing that we wanted with the evangelism, uh, ripple effect course was that you would pray regularly because actually that's the powerful thing, right? It's actually God's spirit who's going to work. He may use you. He may not. And in fact, I am now at the point, because I've ended up getting quite a bit of feedback from my friends, I sort of don't even care what I say anymore because I know even if it doesn't work out, God will still use it. Like, so basically, it's actually God's spirit who'll do the work. He'll use us. But we are, it's okay to be weak. Our transformation happens because of what the spirit does. And it's also what Jesus has done in terms of what he's overall done and what he, the Spirit helps us understand. All right, well, how about I pray and pray that God will use us. Lord, thank you for the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who gives us the courage that we need, the um, discernment that we need. You provide the opportunities. We are your weak vessels as human beings. But actually you want to use us. You, you choose to use us. And we're thankful for what your spirit has done, that you are incredibly at work all throughout history even, so that it's so significant that the people were there from all different languages and you provided the disciples who knew nothing about other languages and helped them to be able to minister to people. So God, we just want to be there. We want to be used by you. We want your spirit to be at work and mightily work in us. But help us, Lord, to rely on you, that you are the one that we need, and we pray that your spirit will work in us. Amen.